Welcome to the Exponential Growth Podcast, where we demystify what it takes to break into tech. I'm your host, James Hudnall, and my goal is to highlight real-life examples of people moving into careers they love, so you can too. Today, I'm joined by Dea Garcia, a former psychology major in pharmacy tech. Now, today, Dea works at LinkedIn as a customer security specialist. She's also a content creator, and I'm looking forward to learning more about some of the things she's working on. So we're going to dive in to learn more about Dea and her journey into tech. Dea, welcome to the show. Hi, James. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my gosh. I'm first podcast, and I'm very, very excited. Kind of nervous, but I hope everything goes well. Hi, everyone. Think, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you're a natural. I, I think it's safe to say it will not be your last podcast, even if uh, you, uh, I'm definitely going to bring you back. <laughs> I already know that. But yeah, oh, why don't you please introduce yourself to the audience? Who is Dea Garcia? Yes, of course. So hi, everyone. My name is Deyanira Garcia. I also go by Dea, as James said. I work as a customer security specialist on the customer information security team. Uh, larger scale, we are under the product engineering team. A lot of people, since we're such a small department, a lot of people don't really know we even exist. So I'm very happy that I get to represent, represent real hard for InfoSec. Very excited. Um, and also, I am half Mexican and half Assyrian. I grew up with the Mexican side of my household. So I'm a very proud Latina um, and also extremely proud because I'm a part of the 4% of Latine in cybersecurity. So representing really hard. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. I love that. And so going back to your childhood, Dea, did you ever think that A, you'd be working at a company like <laughs> LinkedIn and B, you'd be working in the field you are? Oh my gosh, no. I, <laughs> to be honest, I am even surprised I'm even here to begin with. Yeah. Um, I originally wanted to become a forensic pathologist. I really... Mm -hmm love true crime in and not in a weird way by the way audience like you know but uh but also quickly realized that i did not like biology i just i couldn't stand it uh, mem mem uh memorizing things are just not my thing i'm more of like formula so i was really good at chem and math but biology i was like i can't do this especially not for another like eight years i'm like i don't know if this i gotta start <laughs> thinking about other things um, but then I've always sort of been interested in, uh, in learning about people. I love learning about their culture and their background and their reasoning behind actions. And that's sort of like my niche. Uh, okay. So I ended up switching majors to psychology during my junior year of college. And okay. I ended up interning for a psychiatrist at a hospital, which essentially changed everything for me. Okay. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in psych um, on a quest to become a social worker for underprivileged okay. communities especially here in Chicago. Um, but before pursuing a master's program and, and incurring even more student loan debt, uh, I searched for work experience to confirm that this was the right decision for me. But unfortunately, struggled landing my first job, struggled yeah. trying to find positions, especially entry-level positions. They're like, you want five years of experience. It's just like, how? I need experience. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, you I'm need also, experience to get the job yeah. and then you need the job to get the experience. So it's, it's exactly weird how that, that works. Yeah. So, yeah, but I'm also, um, I'm, I'm extremely like pro nurses, teachers and social workers, uh, making way more money than they, than they, than they should, or than they have. Yeah. Um, so that was another, another thing for me. I was like, Oh man, social working, especially at underprivileged communities, like you don't really get compensated, uh, well. So yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of just made the switch to tech from there. Yeah. yeah, no. So you were definitely you were an advocate for the people, and that's I think that's mm -hmm. so amazing. And so I want to go back just a little bit. So if you can take yourself back to high school when you were making that transition into college, it sounded mm -hmm. it sounded like you might have had quite a bit of intentionality behind that decision, even though it changed a little bit. And I wanted to, mm -hmm. I guess, revisit that because uh, I'm just relating back to my own and where I had no direction at all. It was just like a natural extension. Uh, I wanted to know if you, how much intentionality you had at that stage. Yeah, I think just growing up, I've had, I grew up with very strong women around me. Uh, coming from a Mexican household, my great grandmother, she, my abuelita, uh, she immigrated here from Mexico. So she's like been the figure in my life, the strongest person that I know. And um, of course, my grandmother as well. And, and my mom too. My mom, she was a single parent and she had me when she was pretty young as well. So she really hustled and I've seen them struggle and, and, uh, you know, just kind of having these women, these really strong, resilient women around me kind of 
kind of, you know, made me become that person and made me be independent. Um, oftentimes I kind of, kind of get worried. Sometimes I'm like, I might be a little hyper independent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think just having very strong women around me have kind of shaped me to who I am and it's helped me become very ambitious with my mm. goals. When I set my mind to something, I will achieve it. Like I know yeah. I'm going to. Yeah. So, no, I love that. yeah. So yeah. And, and also, like I said, I, I, I knew from a very young age that I was meant to help people. And so that's kind of where the whole forensic pathology, you know, just watching like Criminal Minds and uh, Law and Order, all of those shows when I was younger, I'm like, I want to do this. Right. I want to be able to make a difference in the world. But again, biology. Sorry. Yeah, I just know. <laughs> yeah. I, I went through that. I went through a phase of that. And yeah, I, I didn't make it very far into organic chemistry. And that path was oh, no. closed off <laughs> for me anyway. But uh, no regrets. I'm very glad where I landed up. And I, I think you probably are too. So. Yes. Okay, so you graduate college, back mm -hmm. up just a little bit. Did yes. you know what an internship was? Were you seeking internships? Because there again, I was totally oblivious mm -hmm. running through my course. I'm curious how much you knew about that and how much maybe you explored it. Yeah, so as far as internship goes, I had a really good friend in college. I actually met her in high school, and we went. We ended up going to the exact same college. And at that time, um, again, I was kind of like, oh, man, I don't know what to do. I was, uh, for the first two years, I was at another college, and then I ended up transferring my junior year. And during the summer, my good friend was like, hey, I'm doing, these, I'm doing this internship, and they're always looking for people. Here's the application. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just just see you know i don't know maybe this is something that i would like to do because again helping people you're helping yeah. you're helping people yeah. as a as a psychologist or a psychiatrist in that case um so that was like the only way that i kind of heard about internships but again i think like after college uh, especially regarding like the tech industry i didn't really know anybody or anything like i didn't really have anyone around me that were wanting to pursue you know a job in corporate or pursue especially pursuing a, a job in tech i had knew yeah. no one in computer science yep. so yep. yeah my internship was uh fortunate you know fortunately was kind of like hey this is the opportunity was kind of given to me so yeah, yeah. I'm very grateful for that so. yeah no i love that and going back to what you said i i too i didn't have anyone to kind of pattern match because i feel like yeah for the most part, most things that I know in the past I've wanted to do, it's so easy if you have a pattern or someone that's been mm -hmm. there or done that and you can kind of see and get that guidance. And I definitely didn't have that either. And that's what I love about the, the content that you're producing. And there's so many resources oh. now that just help people, you know, help mm -hmm. former us try to make it to the finish line. So I just, mm -hmm. that's the, the upside with social media and whatnot and being able to produce content like this. I'm just so grateful for that. So going yeah. back to that internship, did you interview for it? We love talking about interviews. I don't know if you can recall how that went for you. Yeah, it was kind of, I don't remember it being like a very formal interview. Uh, I just remember kind of like turning in my application and then that's kind of where I heard back from the psychiatrist. It was kind of, it was kind of like easy a little bit. It wasn't as um, extensive as you'd think for an internship. Okay. So I was very grateful for that. Um, but yeah, psychiatrist was really great. I learned a lot and uh, yeah, so I heard, heard a lot of stories as well that can be considered pretty gut-wrenching and yeah, it just, again, that, that internship really kind of solidified to me that, you know, that helping people was, was my calling. It was the yeah. reason why I'm here. So yeah. and I guess you can't share any of those stories, I guess, because of the, no, of course, it, the yeah, doctor. HIPAA. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, I won't try to get those from you. So that's <laughs> fair, fair enough. Okay. So you're doing the internship. So does that mm -hmm. expire and then it's on to the next thing? How did that play out? Yeah, so internship expired. It was a summer internship, and then okay. of course got back into college, and that's where I essentially ended up transferring, um, or yeah, transferring my major or changing my major to psychology. It was also kind of uh, well, luckily it was a little bit easy because I had already taken a couple science courses, and so it was kind of like an easy transition for me to change. I didn't have to, um, you know, take any more additional classes or anything like that, or I didn't have to stay longer in college because I changed uh, majors. But yeah, so I got I got pretty lucky in that sense. But of course, like after college is where I really was struggling. I was like, I yeah. can't find a job. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, maybe. So is that what comes next? We would love to hear how the how that progressed. Oh, man. Even if yeah. it wasn't fun at the time, maybe it'll be fun to, to revisit. 
Yeah, of course. So my grandmother, she works as a pharmacy technician. And at that time, she was still a pharmacy technician as well. And she worked at one of the hospitals here in Chicago. And yeah, she was the one that told me, I was like, man, I really want to get into healthcare. Maybe, you know, maybe just getting my foot into the door, that might kind of help me, uh, you know, maybe meet people or I don't know, kind of get a sense of, you know, do, do I want to do this? Um, because again, I wasn't finding anything within my field. So I was like, maybe if I just find, you know, get a job working somewhere in healthcare, maybe that can kind of help me decide whether or not I, this is the field for me. And, uh, yeah, luckily my grandmother was like, Hey, uh, within this big hospital, there are several other hospitals. And so she was working in one hospital and was like, Hey, I'm hearing talks of this other hospital. Uh, they need pharmacy technicians. They're in dire need. You should just go and apply and see if you can get it. Um, so it ended up working out. And then of course I still continued to try to find something in my field of study. And again, still couldn't find anything. So what I ended up doing was I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a break from this and I'm just going to do things that my family has not ever had the opportunity to do. So my mom, my grandmother, like everyone in my immediate family, we, the only place that we ever got to travel was in Mex was to Mexico to see my family and we would drive. We couldn't even afford a plane ticket or anything mm. like that. So I was like, you know what, I'm in a, I'm in a good spot where, you know, maybe I can, I can, you know, start traveling even if it's just the U S and I love music. I don't know where I'd be without it. Um, and so music for me is, is so, so important. And so, yeah, I've been kind of traveling around in the U S for a little bit, just kind of going to concerts, seeing some of my favorite artists and yeah, it wasn't until the pandemic hit where everything changed for me. Yeah. I couldn't do anything, yeah. uh, especially in Chicago. The restrictions were pretty heavy, um, but I'm, I'm also very grateful for those for that as well. Um, but yeah, it was the, the pandemic kind of kind of happened and I couldn't do anything. So I was going to work and then coming home and I was like, man, I'm so burnt out. Um, yeah. And, and at that time I was working in the chemotherapy department. So you also see a few things here and there, which it can be pretty, pretty, uh, mentally yeah. and emotionally uh, draining. Yep. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty hard, but yeah. So I was kind of like, okay, I need to do something. And I've always loved video games and I was like, you know what, maybe I should do something with this. Maybe I can trans uh, change, put like, take my hobby and maybe make it into my own job or something. And, yeah. um, at the time I, had a friend who is a software engineer and he's the one that was like, Hey, you know, maybe you should try out some courses on Udemy. Um, there's some video game development courses you can take. So I was like, okay, cool. So tried it out, realized I was like, okay, maybe this is it for me. Okay. I can see myself yeah. doing this. Um, and so, yeah, that, that happened. And then it was weird because I'm pretty sure that the FBI agent in my phone heard me, you oh. know, or like searching up things and, and randomly one day I saw a freaking video of the Europe program. And I was like, yeah. this is weird. This is too good to be true. Like what is happening? Yeah. So I ended up researching the program and um, also went ahead and um, followed them on, on a social media app and kind of reached out to them then. And that's where I kind of had a little bit more information. And that's when they told me that they had just increase the age limit to 26 years old and mm. i was 26 at the time and i was, was like oh man i was like this is life telling me this is yeah. it this is the moment so yeah i applied and that i did have to interview for and it was a okay. it was a more of a formalized interview and okay yeah i, I have was, a question um, before yeah, maybe before yeah, yeah. you're up i definitely want to hear about that but going back to when you were mm -hmm. learning the i guess the the programming or the mm -hmm. the video game programming what were you studying? And a lot of people struggle with that, Dea. Uh -huh. I know I did as well Gosh, when yeah. I started. <laughs> I'm curious if you struggled, how you worked through that, oh, any struggled. actionable advice, things you might have done differently? <laughs> oh, I definitely struggled. I mean, this was something completely different. Like, I didn't know anything about this. Um, I did previously, again, I've always been in love with video games, played it since I was a child. And, um, yeah, always been in, I've always been interested in that, but I was like, I don't know, like video game design or like video game development. I don't know. So this was completely different, uh, way out of my scope. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, so at the time I was on Udemy and I was taking like a, how to develop like a horror video game also mm -hmm. for the audience. I love the horror survival genre. That is my niche. That is my thing. So okay. I was like, Oh, maybe I'll do that. And uh, I remember I was in visual code and I was pretty like, what is happening? Yeah. Um, but those courses, the, the instructors are really, really great. And mm -hmm. I believe that if you had 
some sort of questions or comments, you can go ahead in there and like try to ask questions and then they'd be able to comment or they'd be able, yep. they'd be able to help you. But also, again, I leveraged my friend who was a software engineer that could help me. Um, and then also too, I, um, he's always been so great and very supportive and, you know, I'd go over sometimes and he'd kind of show me what he, his day to day looked like. And it's like, you know what, I can, I can try to do this. I can maybe, um, especially with the video game, uh, development industry or video game industry in general, uh, it's pretty hard to get into for the most mm. part. And, uh, especially if you're just entry level. And yeah. of course, if you go into, you know, trying to do like a startup one day, you can be working on a video game. The next day you don't have a job. And right. I'm like, I, I'm too much of an overthinker to, right. to, to deal with that. I'm like, I need a little bit of security. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, How does that kinda, work? So I'm trying to think back to when I, so Udemy was also my first exposure to programming mm-hmm. in 2019. It was a mm-hmm. cold steel Python course. Oh, and I, oh. I know in Python and JavaScript, it's quite easy mm-hmm. to have a, a quote unquote portfolio piece, mm-hmm. but with like 3d video games, this, this might be speaking to my naivety in that field. Mm-hmm. Could you render like a basic game that you could show on, on like a portfolio page or something like that? So I have easy. to, yeah, no, I would definitely have to go back. Cause, okay. So coming now, uh, where I'm on the, in the reach program, that's something that I'd really like to focus on and, and get back into. Um, so currently I'm studying, uh, I'm studying for the security plus certification exam. So after I get that out of the way, then I want to eventually get back into video game development. So right now I'm not going to be able to do that, but if you yeah. give me maybe like a few months, I can probably, okay. probably it come up possible, with a game. Yes, though. it's possible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, perfect. And I think we, so before that rabbit hole, I think we were talking about the year up program. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, I know you found out they had just raised the age bracket you were interviewing. How did yes. that go? Oh my gosh. Again, it felt like this was life telling me this is what you need to do. Um, so yeah, it was kind of nerve wracking because we did obviously have to wait to hear back from the program. And man, for a little bit, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't think I got it. I don't think I have it. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm working on it, but I tend to catastrophize stuff. Yeah. So I'm just like, ah, dig myself yeah. a deeper hole. And yeah. yeah. So at the time I was like, I don't know if I got it. I don't know if I got it. And, um, also at the time I was at, you know, I was, I was at a job where it was, it was really bad for me mentally and emotionally. And so, yeah, just, I was like, man, I got to get out of here. And yeah, it was, it was pretty nerve wracking, but then I ended up seen an email one night and it was like, you got accepted into the IT yeah. track. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So yes. again, I was like, this is life. Like this is, this is it. This is it for me. Do yeah. or die. So <laughs> did you, did you leave that job as soon as you could and then totally shifted mindset into the, the IT world and that track? Yeah. So the program I believe started in September. And so I was like, you know what? I want to give myself a little bit of time to kind of like, you know, kind of relax a little bit. Um, so at the time I ended up, you know, putting in my two weeks for that job. Um, but I was very grateful again, the overthinking it's my kryptonite. So, (laughs) so, um, at the time I ended up reaching out to one of my former managers at the other hospital that I was working at and to see like, Hey, are there any, uh, like weekend positions that I can take, you know, just, you know, just so that I can have a little bit of income coming in. Yeah. Um, and so luckily that, that happened and yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, kind of a lot, but it all ended up working out. So, yeah. so how was that? How was the program structured with year up? Was it a set like a six to eight month? And then you kind of went through, how was that? Was it, and also was it real time or was it like asynchronous or was it the mix of both? Yeah. So at the time the pandemic was still happening. So this was around, I think this was 2021 and yeah, it was, uh, (laughs) it's a year long program for six months is learning and development. So whatever track that you're in, you're, you know, you're doing like, I believe it was like business writing, which I coming in, I was like, Oh, I feel like I got, I got some skills in my belt for that, but I've learned so much in that, in that course. And then of course I was doing it and then cybersecurity as well. I ended up applying for that track, I ended up getting it. And so I was also doing cybersecurity. And then the last six months, they pair you off into a fortune 500 company to intern for. And that's how I ended up coming to LinkedIn, which is just, again, it's so weird to think about, like I never yeah. in a million years would have thought I would have been here. So right. yeah. So, just, 
So it was an internship with LinkedIn as a part of the mm -hmm. year up, and then I guess yes. reach came later, and that those weren't mm -hmm. necessarily related. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. we actually. It's so funny because my cohort, we look back at it even nowadays. We're just like, oh my gosh, we were really like the guinea pigs for for a lot of this past year that we were, you know, in in the Europe program, but also in the Reach program, um, because at that time. At that time, Reach, it was just Reach, and it was, you know, an engineering boot camp, right? Or, I'm sorry, an engineering program. Uh, but at the time, the the InfoSec department really worked with Reach to say, hey, you know what? We really want to keep this talent. We want to keep these people from Europe. How do we do that? So they ended up working, at, working a deal with Reach where they ended up... Um, they ended up coming up with like, I think it's seven roles in InfoSec. So it was really, really great. We, uh, again, very, very grateful, but yeah, we also had to interview and it was strictly, one of the requirements was that you needed to be a part of the Europe program. So hmm. there was, I, I don't know exactly how many people interviewed for our roles, but I'm, it, it's, it was surely at least like a, maybe a hundred people. So a yeah. little scary, That's amazing. but. Yeah, and so very that grateful. Uh, two questions. <laughs> First, the last conversation I had was with Justice Sanders. Is he also in your cohort as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, because I know mm -hmm. he did the Europe program. Did you know each other when you were in Europe? A little bit. So I really stuck with the Chicago people. Okay. Um, but we did have kind of like cohort sync ups every Monday with the rest of the interns at LinkedIn. So okay. I kind of like here and there, like I knew justice in passing, okay. um, but uh, the other apprentices, the other reach apprentices, because most of them were in information security, I had a pretty good idea of who they are and kind of had a, we built a relationship together. So, yeah. but yeah, very happy for justice as well, because he's coming in completely new, like this is an entirely new field for him. And yeah. it's really great to see how much he's progressed already. And, yeah. and to hear, cause he's, he's actually on the same team as my, one of my very close friends. So mm. she always tells me, she's like, Oh man, he's doing really great. And yeah, yeah he's, he's awesome. So I'm very yeah. happy for him too. Yeah, He's definitely, <laughs> he's got a, he's got this hustle. I, I think you have it as well. Yes. Everybody I talk with has that, but he definitely <laughs> has that. And he just has this, yeah growth mindset mentality that's just this mm -hmm. force has been pushing him along i can tell but yeah. yeah i feel like i feel like you have that the same tailwinds behind you Dea, throughout your journey so <laughs> thank you <laughs> the way that that played out is it you so before you finished with the year up program mm -hmm. the reach opportunity presented itself so was there was no i guess lull in between yeah i mean at the time of course it was you know, they were, it, it was a whole new thing. It was even a whole new mm -hmm. thing for reach as well. So there was a lot of logistics behind all of that. And, you know, how are we going to do this? And, you know, who's going to be the program manager and what's, you know, I'm sure there was just a lot going on in the, in the back. And, and, uh, after our internship, we did have to wait, I believe it was like a month or so, um, before we ended up like applying for it. And then of course okay. we had an interview and we had, um, that take home, that take home little challenge that we had to do as well. So yeah. it, it's for, for someone like myself, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge overthinker and, and you know, that month was pretty hard for me. I was like, Oh mm. man, you know, I'm seeing all these people, especially my friends who, you know, are getting jobs or getting contracts at other companies from Europe. And, you know, I'm here and I'm like, man, I really, you know, I, I really put like my heart and, and my soul and everything into this internship. And, yeah. you know, I just, yeah, it, it was pretty hard, but yeah. you know, for me, I, the, the one thing I did was just like, I never lost hope. I was like, you yeah. got this. Like you just you. You have to keep pushing. You just have to keep pushing. You got this. And so, yeah, yeah, I'm very grateful that everything ended up working out the way that I, that I dreamed of basically. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> and I, and I, so I have a question related to that because I know mm -hmm. people out there listening that are still trying to break into tech and to find that first tech Gosh. job. I know it's so difficult for them to get on LinkedIn and to see mm -hmm. all of these, Hey, I got a job post. So I'm curious <sighs> yeah. if, if you can think back to that month when you were going through that, was, was there anything that you did to help <sighs> you? work through Man. that, especially having that psychology <laughs> background that you had, because yeah. I feel like if anybody can answer that day, it would be you. <laughs> well, okay. So I will say I'm a huge advocate for therapy. So mm. I'm always someone that's like, listen, if you can afford it and you are more than willing to go, please do it. Even if you're not struggling with, it, with anything, like just it's so nice to talk to somebody about your day to day and just kind of walk through like what's going on. Even if it's just a thought, it kind of, kind of helps you break it down. And, and, uh, yeah. So that's like my number one, my number one, like 
you know, if you can go to therapy and there's, there's definitely affordable therapy as well. I know that there's like a few apps, I think it's like Cerebral and, and, uh, I can't remember the other, the other, uh, the other company, but also there's, a. Uh, I actually reached out to, it's called Safe Place. And at the time I had the, um, I had like the state insurance. So I was very grateful at the time that I was able to see, um, it was a, it's like a social worker, like a therapist intern, but I was like, you know what? I just need to talk to somebody. Um, so yeah, I was very, very grateful that I was able to do that. And I was able to do that for free as well. So for anybody out there that's like, I don't think I can afford it, or they may not have insurance. Like try to look into the safe place. That's yeah. yeah, It was really, really helpful. But also I love reading. Reading is kind of like my escape from reality. Um, and again, video games, um, a huge, yeah, I'm like, I'm a huge, again, like horror survival. And at the time, one of my favorite franchises, Dying Light, Dying Light Mm -hmm. 2 came out at the time so I was like all in there um, and just kind of you know when, whenever I was feeling a little down I would just pick up a pick up my uh, my PlayStation remote and just play <laughs> now, I've got, so selfishly a selfish question there Daya, because mm-hmm. I used to be an avid gamer as well and I guess mm-hmm. my wife tells me I'm horrible at moderation and she's absolutely <laughs> right and I know like whenever I do something I just go all in and when I was mm-hmm. playing video games and you know, that's part of why it took me eight years to get that four-year English degree it's because I was mm-hmm. just in hindsight i was addicted to those games so i'm (laughs) curious i feel like you still have that hustle mentality and i'm selfishly curious how do you Mm -hmm. keep it from going off the rails what is this moderation (laughs) How how do you do that uh, as far as video game goes, or just like ever, like my job, I guess. Well, I guess video games, and, and I can kind yeah. of use that as a, to pattern match other areas. For sure. Well, I'm pretty. I have a pretty strict schedule, so if I know that it's going to be a super busy day the next day, I won't play. I'm like, you know okay. what, you need to rest up. And so lately, I've actually started picking up books again, and I've been reading okay. a lot of like murder mysteries, and it's also helped me like fall asleep a lot sooner. Um, I'm just like, I'm 28 years old, like why? Well, I'm like, I'm in bed at 9 p.m. already. I'm like, what's happening? Um, (laughs) But, of course, um, when I do have a little extra time on my hands or, for example, I have this thing where Mondays and Fridays I come into the office and um, don't have makeup. I, you know, I just kind of put clothes on, have my LinkedIn hat on and I'm like, okay, that's it. You know, that's, that's what it's going to be. So I obviously save an extra, extra amount of time, you know, to, to yep. go to sleep. But so like tonight, for example, I'll probably hop on Apex Legends and play with a few of my friends. Okay. And then of course on the weekends, now I have my weekends back cause I, um, I no longer have a second job thanks to this job. So I'll probably sometimes hop on there as well. So again, it's just kind of like moderation, but you know, you have a wife, you have a child. I do not have that. So that also kind of gives me time. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. So boundaries is what I'm hearing and either self-imposed, which it sounds like you're good at, or maybe (laughs) wife imposed. And I mean that with love, Uh, I guess it works. With love. Yes. (laughs) With love. Yes. With much love. Okay. (laughs) So back to your story, you were, Mm -hmm. so you had applied to reach, you went through that month, you were talking to people, which was great. I think that's great Mm -hmm. actionable advice for the audience Mm -hmm. as well. What was it like when you got that call? I cried. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. At that time, I just remember, um, at the time the recruiter was, uh, she sent, he, she sent me an email and was like, Hey, um, you know, what's a good time to, to call you tomorrow? And I was like, Oh my God. Okay. Like this is either I got it or I didn't get it. And yeah, so the next day was on the phone and I was so happy. Cause at that time I was dog sitting. And so when I got excited, the dog was also jumping with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was just a, an emotional time. I just remember getting that call and you know, uh, clicking it and, and I just started bawling. I was like, Oh my gosh, like, I'm like, this is exactly what I've always wanted. And this is what I've, you know, try to manifest for the last couple of the couple yeah. of months. I was like, Oh my gosh, like it's finally, it's finally all coming true. And yeah. yeah. And again, I, I previously mentioned my abuelita or my great grandmother, Rosa Torres. I love her. Um, but you know, she's, she's always been someone that and with everything that I do, I'm always thinking of her. So yeah, it was very emotional. And I remember being like, thank you. Like, I remember just like looking up to the sky and being like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I know at that moment she was, com- she was definitely watching over me for sure. Yeah. No, that's so amazing. <laughs> and so anyone listening now that I guess they haven't been able to experience that phone call, we'll, we'll talk about mm-hmm. it a little bit more later as well, but is there mm-hmm. any 
actionable advice that you might give at this point to someone trying to, I guess, maybe considering a career in yeah. in tech and, and what you're in? Yeah, I think, you know, what is so crazy to me is I previously mentioned business writing course during Europe, and that was when my instructor at the time mentioned that 85% of jobs are filled through networking and 70% aren't even publicly posted. And I was like, man, what? So uh, ever since then, I've always just emphasis on networking, like emphasis on building connections with people. And I even do that now with the new Europe interns. I'm like, you know, come in here and just try to talk to anyone and everyone you can. Yeah. Um, you know, even obviously, you know, for those great recommendations, but networking is such a big deal. And it's something yeah. that I wish I could have, or I wish I, I knew back then. I, again, yeah. I didn't know anybody. I didn't even know yeah. like networking or anything like that. Yeah. And, didn't really hear about LinkedIn either. So yep. yeah, definitely networking, talking to people. So yeah. that's kind of your way in. That's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> and I try to, I, the people that I talk with as well, I try to stress the importance of that. And I, I'm guilty of it because like you, yeah. you know, I never used LinkedIn until I thought I might need it. And I guess mm -hmm. that's fine, but to get the most of it and not just LinkedIn, but the mm -hmm. quote unquote networking itself is just mm -hmm. establishing those genuine relationships over time. So be that mm -hmm. through LinkedIn, through your day-to-day -day activities, clubs that you're a part of, uh, I feel like there's value in that. So that's, that's mm -hmm. great advice. Yeah, so definitely. now <laughs> you are a real live LinkedIn tech worker. You are <gasps> you're doing it. What I think you love to do every day. And mm -hmm. yeah. So so what is your typical day to day like? Yeah, of course. So again, I'm on the customer security, um, cu customer information security team. So primarily our day to days look like we are responding to security and privacy questionnaires from our customers. So we work very closely with our sales and legal department. Um, so basically like to kind of put things into a visual aspect. Sure. Um, so essentially customer comes and they're like, Hey, we want to buy, or we want to start using um, one of your solutions. And so then before they end up signing the contract, they, want to obviously make sure that everyone's data involved will be completely protected and secured. So that's kind of where we come in. They end up uh, de developing their own security and privacy questionnaire that they end up sending over to us that we fill out. Sometimes that means that we also have to hop on customer calls as well. So kind of more of like the technical support um, on the call. So that's kind of what our day to day looks like. I'd say that we aren't as technical in the sense that we're not like coding or anything like that. However, we definitely need to know a really, we have to definitely have a really great understanding of the entirety of LinkedIn security policy. Yeah. Um, so it, it is pretty cool. I, I feel like I get to learn a lot and I'm challenged every single day and and I'm also able to build meaningful relationships with other InfoSec teams as well. Whenever yeah. I have a question about something, I'm like, hey, can you just verify this with me? So it's been it's been really great. But yeah, I, I think uh, I've been telling people this week, especially in the office, that I believe that my role is the perfect balance for someone like me. Yeah. It's 50 uh, percent. I'm, I'm on my screen. I'm focused in. I'm zoned in. And the other half is, you know, talking to people. And yeah. I love that. That's the like the perfect balance for me, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. It's good that you know yourself and you know that that's your balance. And it's great that you've been able to move into that, which is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk to the other stuff that you're working on? Because you recently released an amazing newsletter. Oh, yeah. I know you do a lot of work in that area. Uh, I'd love to learn yes. more. Yeah. So going back to the whole networking thing and not knowing anybody, not knowing any friends or family that were in corporate or especially working in tech, I thought that, man, you know, back then it would have been really nice to be able to see someone that resembled me or my friends or my family who is doing these things and, and you know, is, is working in this industry. And so, yeah, I ended up launching a newsletter, a LinkedIn newsletter. It's called Stories of Chicago. Um, yeah, it's basically me interviewing a POC or minorities in the in the Chicago office about an impactful event that changed the trajectory of their lives. And yeah, again, I love learning about people. And I've also realized that listening to people's stories have really inspired and they, they motivate me as well. And they, they keep me humble. And I'm very, I feel like every story that I listen to, I just, yeah, it, I think it, it brings me the sense of like, I need to express my gratitude for the opportunities that I have in my life. So yeah, yeah. I'm hoping that with this, with this newsletter, it, 
you know, pe people will read it and, and they'll be like, you know what, that person looks like me or that person looks like my family member or, or my friend or, you know, just, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, I'm kind of a softy in a sense. I'm yeah. a very empathetic person. I'm like, I yeah. want peace on the world. Yeah. So I'm hoping that, you know, again, I want to be able to highlight these people as well as, you know, just kind of bring awareness to, uh, just bring awareness to, especially like young adults. They're able to, to, to read that and be like, you know what? I'm more motivated now to continue yeah. my journey to, to break into this industry or just break into corporate America in general. Yep. So, yep. yeah. No, I love that. It's it's a different version of that blueprint. And I think your, your newsletter is phenomenal. I'm going to put a link <gasps> in the show notes. Everybody should subscribe and read it. It, it is truly <laughs> amazing. And I, I absolutely love oh, that. Oh, thank you. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And so now, Dea, I would like to put you on the hot seat so we can better understand the psychology <laughs> of a former psychology major if we can you up for that okay i'm a little nervous <laughs> all right let's do it all right what does your typical morning routine look like oh my gosh okay <laughs> be honest so i like to wake up at least like an hour and 15 minutes before i start the day or I, like i start like i clock in technically um, so that kind of first five minutes, I'm, I like to stretch. I like to give myself a big, good yawn as well. And then I, you know, go into the bathroom and I'm a huge podcast person. So I have, I just recently bought like a Google home. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've been, you know, listening to podcasts. I, I primarily listen to like true crime podcasts. So okay. I kind of listen to that in the morning. Um, and then I just get ready. I think for me, my image is extremely important uh, not in a narcissistic way. I'm sorry. Not, not in that way. No, no, no. Uh, more so in a way that's like, as I mentioned, I'm a part of the 4% of Latina in cybersecurity. And I feel like someone like myself who, I have a very strong personality and I feel like I've oftentimes, especially in the past, I've gotten sort of like judged for it. And, you know, I, I feel like I want to be able to break that barrier on what the typical corporate person looks like or they act like. And again, I want somebody to be able to look at me and be like, oh, she's got her hoops in. Like, okay, like I can see myself in her or, you know, her hair is done. Or sometimes I come into the office with like my natural waves and curls and, you know, do my hair and my makeup and all of that. And, and I want people to be like, you know what, that's really cool. Like she's able to do that. And, you know, it's, it's not the typical, like, you know, uh, not the typical, like certain demographic that you see yeah. that's heavily dominant or have that's heavily dominated in the tech industry. Um, so yeah, I, I think my image is very important to me. And so skincare, makeup, hair, and then obviously get ready for the day. And, yeah. um, I recently just moved pretty close to the office, so it's a 10 minute walk and I love that 10 minute morning walk. It's just yeah. nice, you know, kind of get the I body it's amazing. flowing. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing that you can walk to the office. When I went to the, uh, Sunnyvale campus at the end mm -hmm. of September, we, uh, the hotel that we stayed at, I guess it was 20 minutes mm -hmm. away, but I, I look forward to that every morning because we get to walk uh, through the, I guess, through the Apple campus, even though there was no one there, I guess they were still <laughs> mostly working remote. It was so amazing yeah. just getting to see all the different sites to and from the campus. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, of course, you know, it's very convenient. Um, my building doesn't, uh, specifically have any like community amenities. So I feel like I got a really great deal. However, I mean, it doesn't really matter because I feel like in the office, you know, you get the get the free food and the free oh, yes, coffee. You do. Um, and then the building in general, um, downstairs, they also have like a gym. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's a 24 hour gym, too. So I'm like, oh, this is perfect. I'm like, maybe I'll never even go home at this point. Right. Like, right. There's no That's point. What I felt like when I was in Sunnyvale, I was like, would I even go home? Especially if it was just me, like with with my yeah. wife and daughter. Yes, I will probably go home. But <laughs> if it was a different me, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, um, again, it's just every, every day that I wake up, I'm just, oh man, it's yeah. I'm like, whew, I'm like about to get emotional, but yeah, yeah, I try my best to, to be able to like express my happiness and my gratitude for, for every opportunity that I have. And yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, I've been riding the wave, you know, and, yeah. and it's, it's crazy to feel this way. I'm like, man, right. I was chasing this and I was hustling for, uh, well, at the time it was like 26 years and I'm like, man, yeah. I'm, I'm finally, you know, I'm finally where I've. I want it to be. So yeah. it's just really you've great. That, <laughs> you've mentioned that gratitude and maybe the gratitude practice earlier. And I meant to ask you about it there. That's something where mm -hmm. I, I acknowledge the importance of it because when I'm, yeah. I guess, introspecting, 
I'm bad at that. Like I'm always about, mm-hmm. okay, I finally did this. Now I'm on to the next thing. And I never actually, I'm never actually present. And I'm curious, does that come natural for you? Have you worked <laughs> to establish that practice over the years? Oh, I worked. I worked yeah. for that. I'm, yeah. I'm still working on that. Cause just yeah. like you, I'm someone that is like, okay, I got this. I accomplished this. Cool. All right, cool. Let me just, you know, try to figure out what's next for me. Right. And it's very hard for me to kind of sit and be like, process everything that you went through and just be happy and, and pat yourself on the back for your yeah. accomplishments. I'm someone that I can, can tell everybody I'm, I'm such a hype man for my, uh, for my friends and my family. I'm like, Oh, you're doing amazing. Like you should be proud of yourself, but it's so hard for me to do that for myself. Yeah. And so yeah. again, um, going to therapy has really helped me, but also, you know, again, with the stories of Chicago, listening to people's stories and getting a better idea of who they are. It also kind of helps me, just think like, man, it, it, it gives me a, a sense of, um, again, like just gratitude, being able yeah. to be like, man, you know, like, oh, I made it here and, and you should be really proud of it. And yeah. also journaling too. Sometimes I, uh, I pick up a journal and just kind of like talk about, yeah. about what, everything that I've been through and, and everything that I'm, I'm happy for. So, yeah, no, I love that. And I, two things there. So on journaling, I try to, at least on my birthday every year, just go mm-hmm. to a, a new Google doc and write it out without oh. looking at last year's. And then sometimes going back to look at that. And yeah, I, I don't know that I actually did this last time because mm-hmm. I was at LinkedIn and I was like, I don't even have time to do that, which is horrible because you need to set yeah. time to do that. And to your other point with your stories of Chicago, every single podcast interview that I've done, I've learned so much. I'm learning so much today from you. So I can definitely speak to the, the power and having that, these conversations and better understanding the trials, tribulations, and victories that other people have gone through. So I'm just so grateful mm-hmm. to be able to have these conversations. Yay. See, you're, you're technically practicing gratitude now, just having this podcast, right? Yeah, like- <laughs> it's contagious. I love it. Yeah. All right. So apparently yes. we're both on the hot seat. We'll move to the next. Right. So tell me, Daya, if money didn't exist, what do you think you would do every day? Okay. I think it's probably going to be a basic answer, but I would travel. Every, like I would, I would travel. I'd pick up and just travel. I. Where would you go first? Oh man, I'd love to go to Thailand. I mm-hmm. have just been seeing a lot of videos on TikTok and also Japan as well. I'm, I'm a foodie. I love food. I love trying any kind of food. And yeah, I also just love learning about the culture and the background and, and the people. And so, yeah, if, if money didn't exist, I'd definitely be traveling, but also, (laughs) I also think, again, I'm really into video games and I've thought about this too. Um, I would love to be a professional esports player as well. I like it. (laughs) Okay. Let me ask you about that though. Do you think you still have the reflexes? Because there was a time when I thought, yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, you you short circuited the question. But yeah, I feel like especially me. Yeah, I feel like you might still have it. But yeah, I I do not. Man, I see people. Oh, my gosh. So I still watch um, like Call of Duty esports tournaments. So I'll watch those uh, because I have a, a favorite team that I always root for. Um, but yeah, I, I see them and I'm like, man, I don't even know how people are, how do you even do this? How do you even get this right. good? Like, I don't understand. Right. But again, I mean, if money didn't exist, I'd definitely either be like a Twitch streamer or, you know, do something with like esports. That would be pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. No, I like that. <laughs> see, Mamadou also, when I interviewed him, his, uh-huh. his whole answer might've been play video games. I think he's a little bit more <laughs> altruistic than that, but yeah, maybe if and when money doesn't exist because chat GPT and AI have done all the heavy lifting for us, maybe we can all become uh, professional gamers while still giving back to the communities around us. <laughs> maybe. Oh, man, I've been loving chat GPT. I've uh, been primarily using it for to proof me, proofread my articles, actually, the, yeah. the newsletter articles. That has really been helping me a lot. My manager, uh, she... I think one of her first jobs, she was an editor. So the first two newsletters, she was able to kind of proofread that for me, but she was on a mini vacation and this week she just came back and I was like, I don't think she's going to have time to proofread. Mm. Um, so I ended up just using yeah. chat GPT and it, it did it for me. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing. Scary. I'm more amazed yep. than scared, but it's, I, I feel like you have to, and I feel like this is relevant to the conversation mm. of breaking into tech and being able to reinvent yes. yourself over the years. I feel like you have to learn to work with technology and not just, mm-hmm. you know, remain 
uh, a curmudgeon and just refuse to use it because that's definitely the uh, it's a recipe to to get left behind, which no one mm -hmm. wants to do. So I think it's yeah. awesome that you're leveraging that and trying to trying to keep up. I'm also trying to do the same. Yes, especially with um, like resume building as well, or like cover letters. I'm I've been hearing that that you, that you can do that now. And I'm like that's yep. really, that's really cool. So yeah. I um, before the past cohort, the past year up uh, Chicago interns, before they ended up leaving, I was like, hey, I'm like you can use ChatGPT to help you with your resume or even help you with like interview prep as well. Like yeah. it's just, again, it's very fascinating. It is scary. Obviously I'm a little bit concerned about privacy. Like what does that look like for us? But yeah. I mean, I, I feel like with any technology, I, with yeah. any technolo technological advance, I mean, yeah, of course there's going to be good uses for it, but there's yeah. always going to be an attacker, right? There's always going to yeah. be a bad person. So yeah. going back to the infosec analogy, you're always going to have <laughs> yes. the, the good guys and the bad guys and the, yes. the cat and mouse game for sure. <laughs> yep. The red and the blue team. Yep. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right. If you could send a message to your former self to help you during this transition to tech, what do you think that would be? Oh my gosh. Oh man. I guess the biggest thing for me when I look back at it is, you know, I'd say like, it's going to be scary. Um, especially being a woman and especially being a woman with a very strong personality, it's going to be extremely hard at times. And you're going to question whether or not you belong here or whether or not you're good enough, but you've worked your butt off. You yeah. completely deserve it. And, you know, just, just keep pushing through, never losing hope and just making sure that every day, like you just, you know, you believe in yourself more and more, whether that's like giving yourself a little pep talk or little words of affirmation, just, just, you know, keep doing stuff like that. That'll kind of, you know, it'll, it'll help bring you co um, confidence as well as, yeah. you know, comfortability with, with uh, your progression. So, yeah, no, I love yeah. that. <laughs> All right. What books or podcasts have had the biggest impact on you? Oh, man. Okay. So to be honest, I wish I could sit here and start listing like, you know, financial books like, oh, how to invest your money or, you know, 20 ways <laughs> to save it and, and all of that. Right. Or, or be like, oh, this is like a self-help book. That's really great. But I will say that what I've noticed is and and I just want to put it out there that I I've been there, done that with self-help books. I used to really be like, oh, I really need to really need to you know read a new book about it. And I've actually realized that oftentimes the authors are a certain demographic. So mm -hmm. you don't really get the person or I guess like certain techniques or concepts don't really align with someone's culture or background. Mm -hmm. So prime example, setting boundaries, setting boundaries with your family. Do you know how hard a Mexican daughter, like, do you know how hard it is for a Mexican daughter to set a boundary with her Mexican mom? Like, that's mm. impossible. So, yeah, I wish I could sit here and list that, but I will say when I do listen to podcasts or I do read books, it's oftentimes like murder mysteries or okay. um, like true crime podcasts. Um, but I will say that has actually kind of helped me with my interpersonal skills. Again, going back to psychology, I love learning about people, the reasoning behind why they do something or their behavior. And I think being able to do that has kind of helped me with my interpersonal skills, helped me with my communication skills and, hmm. and um, also be very aware of what's going on in the world as well. Um, yeah. Sometimes I will say sometimes like, man, I wish I was a little delusional, but you know, yeah, I'm, I'm someone that I, I, I like to learn a lot, especially with everything that's going on in the world. And yeah. it's kind of allowed me to be more aware of, of you know, my surroundings and, and what's yeah. going on in the world and, and also kind of helping me have compassion for other people and have empathy for other people as well in their situations. Yeah. So I'd say that that kind of helped me. And then with that, again, that kind of helps me with my role as well. I think um, I'm pretty confident when I say that I do really well when it comes to meeting new people and networking with people. I'm really great at picking up on nonverbal cues as well as, you know, mm -hmm. verbal cues. And yep. I think just because of all of those, you know, books and podcasts, that's really helped me in my, yeah. in my, in my time here. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I'd, ne I'd never thought about it to that extent myself. I feel like I'm also pretty good at picking up those cues. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that I guess you can learn that over time. I mean, we definitely weren't born with that, but I feel like that yeah. is a key strength to try to, I guess, develop or maybe just being aware of it as a thing and as a practice, maybe that will help people get better at developing that because there's a lot of power yeah. in being able to, to read the person that you're talking with or interacting Gosh. with and reading a situation. Oh, definitely. Most definitely. Yes, I completely agree. <laughs>
All right. Tell me about the one or two most influential people in your life and how they impacted you. Oh, man. Oh, this is going to be a tough one because I'm going to I'm probably going to choke up. So I'm so sorry if any okay. if anybody in the audience also kind of gets <laughs> emotional about these things. But I'd say that the very first person that I can think of is, of course, my abuelita or my great grandmother. Um, she again, she immigrated here to the U.S. to give her family a greater opportunity. Um, she is one of the strongest, if not the strongest woman that I've ever known or really just person in general that I've ever known. Um, she's always in the back of my mind with every decision that I make and every goal that I've I've been fortunate uh, fortunate enough to achieve. Um, you know, as a first gen in, in corporate and tech, I I know that she's she's definitely looking down on me, and she's super proud, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So, and then I think like the second person is my manager, Sarah Nicholas. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh my gosh, um, man, she's just been so great. And I remember before I started LinkedIn, uh, one of my coworkers connected with me on the platform, and. When I looked at her profile, man, did the imposter syndrome come out mm. to play. Yeah. Um, she has a master's in, I believe, cybersecurity law at from the University of Cambridge. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> do, do I belong here? I don't know, right. man. Like, what? Um, but I remember it was that first initial meeting with my manager where she talked to me about how she never did anything cybersecurity related until she was 38 years old, I believe. Hmm. And from that conversation, everything just changed. I remember like my confidence building up just from that initial meeting. I was like, okay, great. Like I'm in good hands. And, you know, of course she is my manager, but she's kind of like my mother hen in a way. She's just yeah. such a wonderful person. And yeah. I think her management style is is how I want to be. I know in the future, I'd love to be a manager as well, or even, well, I have high hopes and high dreams. I'd love to sure. be a vice president as well. So I think her management style has really confirmed to me. I'm like, this is how I'd, I want to, I yeah. want to be, you know, I, I want this position. I want to lead with compassion and trust and respect for, for, you know, the people that, that help me, right. Help me yeah. be in this position. So yeah. Yeah, she's she's a wonderful uh, inspiration for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's a that's a big big vote of confidence for Sarah and the the impact mm -hmm. that she has had on you, given everything that you've been through and and the amazing yes. story that you have. So kudos to her. And again, trying to just relate to <laughs> to my version of that, I think I too mm -hmm. have been blessed with great managers in the past, and mm -hmm. I don't know if I took them for granted, but similar to you, especially at my last job before coming to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I definitely learned a lot about how I would want to manage from that manager. Yeah. So it's just amazing. It's contagious, I guess. And it's, mm -hmm. I, I wish everybody was like that, but unfortunately they're, they're not. So, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's, it's great to know that there are people like that, right? Yes. Cause again, like you said, it's contagious and you're like, yes, now I know I yeah. don't see myself not, now I know what a healthy relationship is, right? <laughs> That's right. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. What is one thing you think you're good at that other people might struggle with or most people might struggle with? Ooh, man, I think probably public speaking and networking. Okay. Okay. Um, I, you know, of course, I, I feel like whenever you ask somebody like, what's your irrational fear? I feel like oftentimes you'll hear like public speaking. Yeah. Yes, I definitely get nervous uh, before any presentation, but whenever I am live, I'm present. I feel like my energy levels go up and, um, I've been told that like, I'm really great at engaging with the audience. And so I think that's really, though, that's kind of like my strength. And so I always try to help people, uh, especially with, with Europe students, right? They're coming in, they don't really, this is like their first time with, with a corporate job, right? And, yeah. and oftentimes they'll have to present things and, um, so I, I try to help them. I try to give them tips and tricks. Um, I'm, um, sometimes I'd, I'd say I'm pretty extra. So when it comes to like interviews or meetings or presentations, I'm someone that kind of likes to write out a script and mm -hmm. then I'll just, you know, present, present, present. I'll definitely leverage my friends or my peers. I'll hop on a call with them on teams and I'm like, let me just present mm -hmm. to you and give me your feedback. Yeah. Um, but again, I just continue to present. And then once, you know, the day of, is I've presented so much that now it's just going to come out naturally. So, okay. yeah. yeah. I like that. <laughs> All right. What's one thing you struggle with that other people probably don't? And how do you work through that? Oh, man. Oh, I'd say being a first gen in corporate, especially mm -hmm. tech. 
Um, I weirdly have this guilty feeling at times. I'm not going to lie. I, I'm the only one in my family, including my extended family that works in corporate. So when my abuelita or my great grandmother immigrated to the U.S., she worked in the strawberry fields for pennies. Mm. Um, I've watched my family, especially my mother, struggle being a single parent. Um, and oftentimes, you know, I, I do ask myself, like, why my family didn't have the same opportunity as I did. Um, and I don't I don't like saying that I'm, I'm lucky to be here because I know how much work I it took for me to get here. But right. I'm extremely humbled by this entire experience. And I try my best to express again, like express my gratitude for the things and people that I have in my life. So, yeah, yeah that that's something that I you know, kind of struggle that it, it might be like a, a, a unique struggle as well. Um, yeah. I, I'm sure that other, you know, POCs or minorities might might hopefully listen and be like, you know what? Me too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, I mean, I feel like you're, you're definitely working through that with all the great content that you're putting out and all of the great things that you're doing Dave. So that's, oh. I think that's, that's amazing. <laughs> so is there anything else that you wanted to talk about today or anything else that you think someone that's trying to break into tech needs to hear? You know, I would love to give, I've been giving this advice to, I've actually also been invited to be a panelist for the new year go court. So I just mm -hmm. had that uh, last Friday, I believe. And nice. they asked, one of the questions was like, what advice would you give to us? Right. And I think for me, it's believe in yourself. And if you don't, then you find genuine people that do. Mm -hmm. I think that research suggests that on average, it takes like 66 days for, uh, for someone to make or break a habit. So just imagine people around you for 66 days saying, I believe in you. <laughs> I feel like you're going to eventually just slowly but surely start believing in yourself. And so, yeah, that's that's like my, my, my best advice that I can give to yeah. someone. No, so, I love that. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. What's your number one piece of advice to anyone listening that thinks they might want to make a similar change if it isn't something that we've already talked about? And maybe oh it is. Oh my gosh. Do it. Um, just do it. But I'm someone, right? It's like the Nike slogan, <laughs> right? Just do it. No, I think, um, again, I take very calculated risk. I'm someone that I, you know, if I'm taking like a, a big risk, you know, going back to taking that risk of like, you know what, I got into this program, I'm going to have to quit my full-time job. And at the time I was 26, I didn't have, that meant no health insurance either. Right. Um, so it was, it was pretty, pretty hard. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking of all these things of like, is this worth it? I don't know. Is this my time? I don't know. And I think the most important thing is to take responsible risk. If you, if, if you hear me and you're like, oh, I, you know, I'm just like her, it's definitely try to be very calculated with the risk that you take and, right. and be, have risk, like take responsible risk. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very important. I think if you don't, if you're not even just a little uncomfortable, then, yeah. then you're not going to be able to grow. So yeah, no, you, that's, you took the words out of my mouth. That's usually what I try to tell <laughs> people as well. If you're, if you're always comfortable, you can't grow. You have to get, you don't have to do anything, but if you can get, mm -hmm more comfortable being uncomfortable. I feel like that's that perfect area for growth into whatever direction you want to grow. Yeah, definitely. All right. You got this people who's ever listening. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Just do it. All right. What's next for you Dave? Are you going to work your way up the, uh, the LinkedIn ladder, make your way, so. produce some great content? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am extremely happy with where I'm at in my role currently, but I can definitely see myself becoming like a vice president of a company, maybe LinkedIn in like 20 or so years. Wink, wink, right? I think you got it. <laughs> you know, I obviously I'd like to do it for, you know, my ambition for myself, right? But I also want to do it for my Latine people, right? But, um, you know, I also want to be able to like help people with... Um, you know, helping people is kind of like my greatest passion in life. So I want to be able to like make a difference and, and help people grow, uh, putting an emphasis on like community and trust and compassion. And, and I think it's so beautiful when you're able to be in a, in a role where even just being a mentor, right? You're able to help someone grow professionally, but also in a personal level. And I think it's such a beautiful thing. So yeah. I'd love to be able to, you know, Hopefully one day, you know, 20 years or so, be able to, to, you know, climb that corporate ladder and, and be able to make a difference on a, on a much larger scale. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you're already doing that day and I don't think it's going to take you 20 years to, to achieve <laughs> what you're, what you're aiming for. So you just keep it up. Where can oh, people gosh. go to find out more about you? 
Okay, well, would I be a LinkedIn employee if I didn't plug my LinkedIn profile, Probably right? Probably not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you can find me under the Anita Garcia, D-E-Y-A-N-I-R-A, Garcia, and that's also where you'll be able to to uh, find stories of Chicago and kind of keep updated with, with, you know, work life and, and all of these accomplishments. And yeah, just that's where that's where you'll find me most of the time. Yeah, and I will put links in the show notes for both of those. And they, uh, I just want to thank you again so much for coming on and telling your story. I thought I knew you and I learned so much <laughs> today. And selfishly, I learned so many areas of improvement for myself. Aww. And I know that I'm not the only one listening that did. So thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciate this. I'm not going to lie. I was, again, I was very, very nervous. I'm like, Oh, I don't know. Am I going to do well? But again, this conversation was just amazing and and you're such a great host. So very happy. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks for listening. If you got value from today's show, please consider leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Spotify. It's a free way you can support the show and help other people just like you find the story and others like it. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to follow the show on whatever podcast application you use. And most importantly, if you know someone that might be interested in breaking into tech, tell them about the show.